Good morning, Calvary. Good morning to our podcast listeners. We're thankful you are listening today as well. We are uh, excited about today. It's the day we've prayed for a long time. Today is the groundbreaking ceremony that we have this afternoon. I've heard that uh, WLFI is going to be there. The paper is going to be there. The mayor is going to be there. Pulled pork is going to be there, which is probably what you care about. And, and so I would encourage you to come out today um, at 5 o'clock. Bring a hammer if you want to. It's, just, it's a really good day. But hear me, this isn't about just the building. This is really about us celebrating what God is doing in and through the lives of our people and praying and asking God to continue to move in our midst. We're hoping that next week at Easter, on, uh, at, when we meet at Harrison High School, by the way, the services next week are at 915 and 1045. Okay, so we'd love for some of you to come at 915, but if you can't come at 1045, we're hoping for 1,200 people next Sunday at Harrison High School. And as you come, come expecting, but there's so much going on. We continue to grow. We continue to reach people. We continue to do things. There's, there's a, even a servant, so it's Servanthood Saturday coming up on April 18th. We encourage you to go ahead and block that off in your schedule from 9 to noon and come up. Because the reason I want us to go to Harrison, the reason that we're trying to do this Servant Saturday is to show our community that we care about them because we care about Christ. Let Christ shine through us. You see, we're not building to glorify the name of Calvary. Because honestly, there isn't that much there to glorify. We're building to glorify the name of the one who died on Calvary, and his name was Jesus. We want other people to, to follow Christ and to create space and to create movement. So today, it's not just a celebration of look what we're doing, but rather a time where we are going to gather together and pray and ask God to be with our future. So would you come and would you join us in that journey today? We're uh, going through the book of Romans as we get approaching Easter. Next week is going to be a really powerful message. Uh, Trevor's going to have an artwork. To, we hope you come and invite your friends. But today, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34. And let me set this up for you. This series is all about to know your salvation. We have a saying around here, followers make followers who make followers of Jesus. That's what we're about. And one of the things we say around here is followers share what they Good, let's do that again. Followers share what they know. Followers share what they know. And our whole point in doing this is we want you to know more about Jesus. And as you know more about Jesus and know more about your salvation and your salvation story, you'll be able to articulate it with others around you. So as we've done this, we, we started this off by saying in Romans chapter 1, the whole point of Romans is we will not be ashamed of the gospel or the good news of Jesus. If you're a follower of Christ, we will not be ashamed of being a follower of Christ. And from, as a result of that, the way that we know that we're doing that is found in Romans chapter 12, which Trevor talked about a few weeks ago, and that if you are living and following Christ, if, it, if he is worth it to you in your life, then you will worship him. And we talked about how we're all worship things and how you know what you're worshiping is where you put your heart's attention and your mind's, your heart's affection and your mind's attention. And so what you deem is worthy of worshiping is where you will put your heart's affection and your mind's attention, whether that's a basketball game or whether that's your work or whether that's your family. But we believe as followers of Jesus that he is worth everything and therefore we should worship him. So we chased this, we, we tried to articulate more and more about what this means. Last week we talked about the freedom of Christ. Two weeks ago we talked about how we used to be justified. And, and today we're talking about after we are free that we should live in victory. Do y'all want to talk about victory today? It's not a depressing topic at all. It's a great topic and it's the week before Easter. We get to, to talk about what it means in our salvation to walk in the victory of Christ. So if you have your Bibles, look with me in Romans chapter 8. Verses 31 through 34, when it says this, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, then who is against us? For he did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect or God's followers? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. See, he's building up. We've, we have this freedom that we talked about the early part of Romans chapter 8. And because we have this freedom, he's articulating four arguments about how we can have victory. And the first one is this. No one can separate us from the freedom we have in Christ. We have victory because no one can separate us from God. If God is for us, 
then who is against us? At the end of verse 31. If God is the one who justifies at the end of verse 33, who is the one who condemns? For Christ Jesus, the one who died and even more has been raised, he is also at the right hand. Now, let, let's chase this back. Let's chase this rabbit a little bit. Go back a couple weeks when we talked about how we are justified. You see, we were, we were the defendants in the court of life. We were defendants, we were found guilty. We knew we were guilty and our defense attorney not only advocated for us, but when our sentence came down, he said, I will take the sentence that we were worthy of dying from upon myself. And so our advocate, Jesus, came and he died on the cross and allowed his body to be persecuted, uh, pierced and his blood to be poured out. He was a, a, a payment for us so that we might be made just because justice had to be paid there was a transgression that had to be made up for. And in doing so, God said, you are now justified. Justice has been paid. You have been made free. Now, in this freedom, can someone come to you and take this from you? We live in a world that is full of accusations, right? Watch the news and watch politics, right? One party says the other party did this. The other party says that party did this. And it's never anybody's fault. Unless we just blame the, move, the, the politics. We do this in our marriages sometimes. Those of us who are married, we sit there and go, well, she did this. Well, he did this. And it can easily escalate. Is that just me or anybody else? Ever? Y'all are looking at me like, you're... okay, this is a confession time. And so, but we can do it in father, son, or, or, or mother, daughter, or mother, daughter. You can do it in that relationship too. You could do this at work where, where if everybody else would just act like they're supposed to act, then we could all get along. But God says, you know what? You are justified. No one can come and blame you anymore. In other words, you have been made right. You, you were guilty. You were at fault. And they had the right to look at you and go, you made mistakes. But guess what? When they look at you now, they should see Jesus in your life. And no matter what other people say, you are made right. You are justified by what God has done. So who can hold anything against you? You see, that's where victory comes that people can't come in and they can't separate you. And what does this look like? How do we, this week we hosted a bunch of college students who helped us begin to move the playground. Some of you were in Jamaica, Walt Disney World, enjoying spring break. Some of you were in Belize. I know I, I, I Facebook stalk you more vicariously trying to live through your warmth. And this week they were moving the playground in the snow, a group of Alabama students in the snow. It was amazing to watch and fun to watch as they, you know, what's this white stuff? Dandruff falling from the sky. No, it's snow. And so they were doing this. And, and as I was watching this, we had a uh, young baby that one of the, the leaders brought and they stayed with us. And I loved watching this baby. And this baby reminded me of when I first had my sons because this baby, whenever the mom would walk around the corner, he would cry out, Ma! you know? And it reminded me when I first brought my boys home. When I first brought my boys home, I was that guy that goes, do something, right? And you've heard me say this before. I was like, what's the point? You're not doing anything. And I would change diapers and go, this is fun. You know, and she's, she's all like, oh, this is so... And I was like, oh, come on, do something. But the point where, like, fatherhood clicked for me was the, was the moment when I started driving in to our drive. And I knew with anticipation that when I opened that door, one of my boys would be going, dad's home. And when I, when I would walk in the room, they would see my face light up and they would know that they were excited to see me come in. And now what happens when you have that child who recognizes you and wants to be with you is the exact opposite when you leave, right? And I would start to go, dad's got to leave now. And then they would start crying because they wouldn't understand why you had to leave. And I'm talking very early age, right? Now get this, for those of us who are with Christ Jesus, it's like we have a good father. And I know not everybody in here had a good father, but we had a good and great father and we can't wait to spend every moment with him. And the good news is we can. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't leave us for a moment. He's never outside of our reach. He walks with us every single moment so that when someone looks at us, they don't see anything other than Jesus because he dwells with us. We walk with him. We are following him. We are in his presence at all times. So who can separate us? No one, because he never leaves our side. That is exciting. So everything should be good, right? Well, unfortunately, there are circumstances in our life that can cause problems, but he addresses this too. Look with me in verse 35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish 
or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. These are all about life circumstances. So uh, no one can separate. That's the first argument. And his second argument is this. Life circumstances cannot separate us from God either. So no one can separate us from God for those who are walking with Christ Jesus. And life circumstances cannot separate you. Now, let's look at this. At first, the list just looks like a casual list. But let's, let's break this down a little bit more. Affliction and anguish. These are sorrowing circumstances. They are emotional circumstances that, that we deal with. Have you ever had a sorrow? Okay, that baby walked in the, was in the room and the mom walked around the corner. The baby started crying. Why? Because he couldn't see her anymore. You ever felt that, mo that moment where you're like, God, are you here? My prayers aren't going past the ceiling. God, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to sense your presence. I'm trying to feel you. But, but life circumstances, I feel emotionally abandoned. Maybe you feel lonely, a lack of friends. Maybe you're struggling with worry. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with anxiety. Or maybe you're, and God says, I am right here with you. There is no sorrowing circumstance. There is no emotional circumstance in your life that will separate you from me. I am not only with you in eternity, but I am with you right now. The second group of circumstances it lists there is the, just the one of persecution. Now, we might think we know what persecution is, but we don't. Because I doubt any of you have ever had a gun to your head that says, renounce Jesus or die. You know, we might think, oh, someone threw an insult at me. I don't know that that's persecution. Persecution is where your life is in danger or someone's life is in danger or there is a severe casualty that is a result of you following Christ. But even in this, let me tell you this, the Bible says that persecution cannot separate you from God. Why? Because if they take your life, guess what? You get to be with Christ. So persecution cannot separate you from the love of Jesus. Now, the third one, famine and, drink, and nakedness. Famine and nakedness. Famine is the idea we, we don't have food. We have grocery stores at our beck and call, right? And, and we walk into those grocery stores and think about, really think about what it's like to go to one of our grocery stores here in the United States of America. Aisle after aisle after aisle after aisle of food unless a major, major snowstorm is coming, and then it's just aisle after aisle after aisle, empty bread aisle of food, right? But there's still tons of food there. We don't know famine. But back in the day, there was this real idea where if it didn't rain, famine would happen. And it said, famine can't take you away from the love of God. The physical circumstances of life can't take you. Nakedness can't take you away from God. I'm thankful you're all wearing clothes. Thank you. I, some of you really, really thank you. And, and this idea of nakedness can't separate you from the love of God. Here's what I know. In, in third world countries, there are kids, boys and girls, who get really sick because they don't have shoes. And because they have to walk through the dung of animals and worms get in their lives and then their bodies become infested. And, and one of the simplest cures for people in the world is to give people shoes so that their feet can be covered. It protects them and keeps them healthy. In our life, we aren't often naked, but it's this idea of really having clothes and being covered. And, and God says, I've covered you. So you will never be alone. So in this physical separation, you cannot, there is no famine, there is no physical ailment that can separate you from the love of God and sword and danger. This is when other people try to inflict punishment on us. When they say you must do this in your work or you're about to lose your job or, or there's dangers in your life and you're sitting there going, God, how does this work out? Is ISIS coming to America? Ooh, you know, all that stuff. And we sit there and we feel endangered and we feel scared and God says, no, nothing. So there is no life circumstance because if you look at this, the anguish is a representative of the emotional. The persecution is the spiritual circumstances in our life. The, the famine, it is the physical circumstances. So in no emotional, spiritual, or physical circumstance may you be separated from the love of God. That's pretty powerful. So no one can separate you because God is always with you. And no circumstance that may come up in your life will separate you from the love of God. So therefore you have victory. So here's the question, do you walk in victory? And sometimes we, we say, I want to walk in victory, right? But, but there are these circumstances in life. There's still suffering. There's times when I think that God is here, but I still struggle. How do I reconcile with this? Well, that's really the question of the problem of good and evil. And the problem of good and evil I could, I could spend three weeks on, but let me just cover it basically like this. Evil exists in the world because sin entered the world. 
You understand that, right? That every evil thing that has happened in this world is a result of mankind or womankind choosing to walk away from the love of God. And you might go, I did nothing wrong. Right, but humanity did. And in your life, you have messed up too. That's next week's message. Come back. It'll be exciting. But uh, this idea of really understanding that all of our mistakes, all of the gossip, all of the worries, all of the slander, all of the, any persecution is all a result of us missing out our purpose and our point, which is walking away from Jesus. It's the fact that we are all deserving to be in the defendant's chair. But the just God did not leave you there. Justice had to be paid, and so therefore evil entered the world. But when justice happened, and when God justified us, he made a way for us to be reconciled into God. As a result, we must have a different world view. Look with me in Romans chapter 8, verses 36 and 7. Romans chapter 8, verses 36 and 7. How do we view this world, our circumstances, our difficult struggles? As it is written... Because of you, we are being put to death all day long. This is cheery, right? We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. But look in verse 37. It says, no, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. Okay, so we have two verses here that seem to conflict. No, we, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. This was the author's recognition of an Old Testament Psalms which said, Because evil was in the world, we had to cry out, Father, save us. Look with me in Psalms chapter 44, verses 22 through 26. And we'll see that Paul takes a direct quote from um, Psalms 44. It says this, Psalms 44, 22. Because of you, we are all slain all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Exact quote. Now verse 23, wake up, Lord. Why are you sleeping? Get up. Don't reject us forever. Why do you hide yourself and forget our affliction and oppression? For we have sunk down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up. Help us. Redeem us because of your faithful love. You see, they knew in the Old Testament that they had walked away from God. They knew that they were separated. And this was a declaration that evil is in the world and, and, and the circumstances of their life seemed to weigh down their shoulders. And so they were saying, God, rise up. Save us. We need a savior. We need someone to come in and and bring us out of our muck, out of our mire, out of our depravity, out of our sin. And the good news, it happened on Easter Sunday. He did rise up. He did rise up out of the grave. And so we can walk with him and therefore we have a different perspective. So Paul in this chapter, he comes to the third argument where he says, our circumstances give us a different perspective In the Psalms, they were saying, rise up, God, where are you? We need you to intervene. We need you to show up. We need you to make a difference in our life. And in Romans, he says, after Christ has come, after he has made a way, his perspective changes from one of, God, when are you coming to? Listen to verse 37 again. No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. You see, Our circumstances have changed. Our view has changed because we are no longer dead to death, but we are made alive in Christ. So the way that you live a life in victory is you look at through the lens of the cross. Because when Jesus died on that cross, he said, you are no longer bound to the justice that you deserve, but you have been made free. And even though you go through difficult circumstances in life, God will help you overcome. How do we do that? By understanding that we are conquerors. Verse 37, no, in all these things, we are more than victorious. Or the King James says conquerors there. We are victorious. We have victory. We have, in other words, spoiler alert, God wins. Pretty cool, huh? And so we are victorious. We are more than victorious. Nothing can defeat us. Yesterday, there were some really great basketball games on. And I don't know if you thought, who cares? I'm not going to get into who won or who lost. I'll just tell you they were exciting games. And, and, and I was really nervous and my kids were nervous and we were watching these games. And, and, and I had to make a little confession to my family later. See, we have this TV that, that actually delays the game cast. And so when we were watching the game, I was on my iPad going, refresh, 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 refresh. And so I knew at the end of the game we had won, but our kids didn't know that we had won yet. And so I was watching the last minute going, this is going to be awesome. And they were watching the last minute going, oh, oh. 
Can you imagine the difference in life, though, if we didn't know how it ended? Can you imagine the consternation as we're holding on, going, how does this end? How does this end? No, we have the cliff notes. We have the cheat version. We are looking ahead. We know we may watch it unfold in our life, but we know in the end, our team wins because our God has already won. We are victorious. So how do we live with that? Well, we not only live through life's circumstances going, we are victorious, but it says we are more than victorious. So wait a minute, we can have more than victory? Yes. How do we have more than victory? How do we, have more, how do we become more than conquerors? Well, the person who has the lens and the perspective of viewing life through the reality of the cross, the reality of what Jesus has done for us, get this, whatever comes our way, we look at it and we go, there's a blessing in this for me. Victorious, victorious people can sit there and go, we win. But through the lens of the cross, we are able to look into perspective in the future and go, whatever life circumstances come my way, I will receive a blessing from it. So when you go through anguish or anxiety or the emotional distress, you get to lean into God Anguish can pr promote humility, and humility can give you a proper perspective. And so even though it's not always fun with whatever circumstances come in your life, with whatever trials you face, you can cling to it, and you can sit there and go, okay, I may not want to go through this, but my God will bring about good because he has won the victory. And my God will allow me to see things different. When, when whatever trials you're going through, whatever circumstances, we are not afforded the luxury of sitting on our hands and going, I'm miserable. No, because we know we win. And because we know we win, because God is with us, we have the obligation to live a life of hope and of joy and of peace. So whatever comes our way, we cling to God. So other circumstances, when you go through persecution, if you ever go through persecution, you know that no matter what happens, you will glorify God. And because you will glorify God, there is hope there. When you go through famine, you get to lean into God's dependent and God's provision. There's been a lot of times in my life where I'm sitting there going, God, I don't know where the next bill's coming from, especially when we were first married and living in a tiny, tiny, tiny seminary apartment that our bedroom was, you know, was a tiny, tiny, tiny apartment. And we sit there and go, God, where's the next bill coming from? And then lo and behold, there'd be a check in the mail. And, and I thank God for those times because it reminded us to lean into the provision of God. And it was a blessing that we had to do that. We also had those moments where danger comes and we have to go after 9-11 and, and the, the towers collapsed and we had to go back and the country started turning back to God. Do you remember that? Why? Because in times of danger, we get to see how God is victorious. And we were reminded that this life is not about this life. And we are able to go, there is a blessing, even though the world meant this as a curse. We know that we are victorious. And as a result, we can live whatever circumstances come our way. We will not live the defeated life. We will not hang our head. We will not sit there and go, woe is me and feel sorry for ourselves. Why? Because that is against what the Bible says, because we are victorious. Live like it. So do you live like it? Here's the question I have for you today. What are life circumstances? What are the things in your life that you sit there and you go, if God would only intervene? What are the things in your life that you're sitting there holding to and clinging to and you feel like there won't be peace in your life until these are resolved? I got news for you. Even when they're resolved, if you don't live a life that is victorious, another thing will come and will rob you of your joy. But when you learn to live the victorious life, then whatever comes your way, you get to go, ha, I already know the end score. So therefore, I will not be defeated. Do you live life with a blessing? What are the circumstances this morning that you need to give to God? Is your marriage struggling? Uh, the relationship with your kids? Or are you struggling at work? Are you struggling in, in loneliness and apathy? Are you struggling with financial needs, physical, emotional, or spiritual struggles? Whatever you're doing, I would say this, give it to God and live the victorious life because he has already defeated death. Whatever problem you have, you can have victory over. Now hear me, I'm gonna separate myself from the name it and claim it people. You know what I mean by that? It's like, God, I want a hot tub. Huh? Get a hot tub? No, that's not the Bible, all right? It's a state farm commercial, it's not the Bible. <laughs> 
We're not saying that you can claim what you want to claim and get rich. That's not the Bible. What we're claiming is you get to put on the glasses. You get to put on the lens. You have corrected vision that helps you see what life is about. What is life about? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because he is worth everything. So therefore, I will worship him with my mouth. I will glorify him in all circumstances. And in every circumstance, he will be exalted. That's where freedom is and that's where victory is. How are we afforded that freedom? Through Jesus, through his love. Argument number four is this. As a result of Christ's sacrifice, no body, no circumstance, can separate us. Our circumstances give us a perspective so nothing can separate us from the love of God. Cling that this week. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. God, I must become less and you must become greater in my life. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing, zero, zilch, nada, nothing, whatever language you want to speak it in. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. So as a result, Romans 8, 38 and 39 takes on a whole awesome, amazing perspective where it says this, for I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth or any created thing will have the power to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am persuaded that nothing, did you get that? Life, Death, that can't separate me. Why? Because I'm with Jesus and he's with me. And everywhere I go, he is with me. You can't separate me. Death can't separate me. I'm with God from now to eternity. Angels can't. If angels can't, then no government can, right? Are we all glad about that? No government can. Now, the government can take you, make you taxes. The government can do awful things to you, but the government can't separate you from the love of Christ. People can come and they can attack you. They could take away your family. They could, they, could, they could take away your job, but they can't separate you from the love of Christ. And when you have the love of Christ, you have victory because you have everything you need. You see, you and I were made for this relationship. You and I were made for dignity. And as we're gonna see in a baptism here in a few moments, we were made to walk with Christ. And when Christ died for us, he wants us to be restored in him. And, and so the reason we baptize people is to remind us that the ultimate purpose in our life is to die to ourselves, which is represented in us submerging in the water and raising to new life, which is represented to the new life we have with Christ, which is the victorious and free life. It's afforded to us through the love of Christ. See, it all comes down to this. The reason we cannot be ashamed of the gospel is the love of Christ. You see, love defeated death. It is love that gave us life. It is love that gives us hope. It is love that gives us victory. It is love that gives us the good news, the gospel, and therefore we will not be ashamed because living our life for him is worth everything. What are you doing this week? Do you want to live the victorious life? then here's what I would challenge you to do. Keep praying the prayer you prayed last week. Lord, help me to be less and you to be greater in my life. The other thing I would challenge you to do is this week, I urge you to hunger after God. It is Easter week. If you can't have victory this week, we're all in trouble. It's Easter week. But let me tell you something. If you try to live the victorious life, there'll be all these whispers in your head saying, you're not good enough. No, nothing can separate me from the love of God. You fall short. Nope, nothing can short separate me from the love of God. How dare you? You know what I did. No, nope, nothing can separate me from the love of God. People may whisper, people may slander, people may count you as a sinner, but you know that you are a follower of Christ. You can walk with them. Now, we may struggle with this at times and we may have doubts and we may have fears. And what I would encourage you to do is hunger after God. And that's why when Jesus was with us, In the last moments, he knew that there might be times in our life where we struggle. And he said, so take a simple thing like a meal. And every time you gather together, I want you to be reminded of what I've done for you. And so when you take the bread and you break it, remind yourself that I have not gone from you, but that my body was broken for you. And that you can claim victory because I was sacrificed on a cross so that you might walk with me. And when you take the cup and the juice, and you, and you realize that my blood was poured out for you, do this in remembrance of what I have done for you so that you might have victory. For those in this room who have never given their life to Christ, what does that mean? 
It just means you've never come to a place in your life where you've truly given your life to him. You, you said, okay, God, I want to die so that you might become in me. And it doesn't mean you have to physically die. It means that you have to say, I'm no longer going to live for my ways, but I'm gonna live for yours. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, that Easter really happened, then you can be saved. And all you simply have to do is admit it and believe it and confess it. The ABCs of your faith. And what I would say is if you could this morning, do us a favor and take out your connect card that's in your bulletin folder and check that box. And I know sometimes it's hard for you guys, but get over it, right? A real man would, would say, I wanna know more about Jesus. And what I would say is wherever you are, come to the place where we can tell you what it means to be a follower of Christ and so that we can celebrate with you a new life. To those in the room who are followers of Christ, you, you know you're a Christian, you know you're a believer. Here's my encouragement, live the life of victory. Do whatever it takes this week to live and to know him more because as you know him more, you will want to share him more. We're not breaking ground today to build up a, a sanctuary for ourselves, but we're building a new building and starting it this week so the glory of God may be known to the uttermost parts of the world. This Easter week, here's my challenge. Invite someone to church and tell them this, shock them. Listen, I have a great church and we'd love for you to come, but would you please just go to church somewhere? that proclaims the name of Jesus. Hear me, it's not about Calvary. I pray for our other churches in our town. I'd, I'd mention their names, but it ends up becoming problematic because I leave somebody out. I pray for the other churches and I pray for more churches to come to this area because I want every single person in this area to know of the saving love of Jesus Christ. So God, would you come into the West Lafayette community, the greater Lafayette area, to the state of Indiana, to the United States of America and spread to the globe. Let it begin right now this morning as we claim victory and reminding of what he did for us. So as the deacons come forward, let me just pray for you. God, I am so thankful for what you did on the cross for us. God, may we walk with you in the glory of your name. May we claim victory through your cross and live a life not beaten or defeated or got down, but to see whatever circumstances come our way that you are with us. So God, we ask that you come. Be clear. For those who don't know you, God, we ask that you would help us to um, choose to follow you. And Father, in all things, we give you the glory because this is your church and we are your people. In your name we pray, amen.